Um, let me just introduce the session then. So for those who don't know, I am Glenn Poole. I'm the CEO of the Australian Men's Health Forum. This is uh, Men's Health Connected, a month-long long online summit on different aspects of, of, of men's health. Um, what the Australian Men's Health Forum does is we work to connect individuals and organisations who are working in different ways to improve the lives and health of uh, men and boys across Australia. Um, we don't just look at uh, a medical perspective, we look at mental health, social health, uh, physical health and initiatives that are actually are uh, really good at um, engaging with men effectively. And one of the vehicles for engaging men effectively that we've known for a long time is sport. And that's why we're delighted to have this entire day focused on, uh, on sport and men's health. So um, just a bit of a quick guide for those who uh, haven't used Zoom before, if you're just joining us for the first time this, this afternoon. Um, we've got a chat box. Most of the features you find in the little black bar at the bottom of the screen. So click on the chat box and say, hello, I'm just gonna use that now to show you. I see, I'm not quite reading it. I'm seeing there's a bit of a bit of a sports banter going on in the chat box here already. Uh, so I'm just gonna say hi and get out of the way and let you do that. It's a great place to post links, um, to uh, introduce yourself, to chat with each other uh, and ask questions. It adds a richness to the conversation. Um, that uh, most people find really helpful and you can save all the links afterwards. The other feature is the participants button, uh, which we might come to later when we get you to raise your, your hand. I've already told you about uh, changing names and last but not least, uh, reactions. In the bottom bar, there's a little smiley face and a plus sign. Um, it really helps with speakers if you can show a bit of encouragement because they can't smell you or hear you because all your mics will be muted, but a, a clap, like that or a little thumbs up can uh, can be a little way of just uh, showing that you're, you're 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 enjoying what they're putting down for you so um just to put this part of today's conversation in context we started the morning with a very specific focus on the ways in which sport recreation physical activity is clearly uh, good for for men's health we had uh, three great speakers who really outlined all the sort of the science and the data and some examples of projects that are already getting great results, improving men's health through sport. Um, we then moved on to a specific focus on the way that different sports based programs are working to improve men's mental health and tackle male suicide. So shifting from the idea that sports based programs are just about physical health, they can be used to engage men around other issues such as mental health and suicide prevention. Um, over the lunchtime, we were joined uh, by Paul Peacock of uh, the Bouncing Back Project in WA, a, a cricket-based program. He was both sharing their approach to mental health through, through cricket clubs, but also just having a bit of a conversation about the challenges we're all facing in the context of, of, of COVID-19. Of COVID and, and here really to sort of um, top the day, is a focus on the question, um, can we do more with sports brands? Are we converting all our chances? Uh, could we be doing much more with what we are? Already know um, from our work and from this morning, uh, that the lives and health of men and boys, but could we be doing more? And very specifically, could sports brands uh, be doing more? Um, we have a final session every day. Um, we put it in the program as going through till 5 p.m. In reality, it's too long to be on Zoom and usually we wrap up no later than 4 p.m. So we run the final session on from the end of this session and just allow people to say their goodbyes, to exchange details, reflect on any final thoughts and it usually takes us through to uh, no later than, than 4 p.m. But this specific session runs for 75 minutes through to 3.15. We've got five great speakers, so I'm gonna get out of the way and let them do the talking. And slightly different from the last two sessions we had this morning, uh, rather than give them each sort of 10 or 15 minutes, we're gonna do a round of questions to mix it up a little bit. So I'll mix up the order um, as well, just to keep it lively, like you're being swapped in and out or substituted or moved from forward to back. I'm trying to really work on my sporting metaphors today. Um, the first question is going to be really easy. It's going to be an open goal. Um, I'm going to simply ask, who the hell are you? Uh, tell us about yourself. Tell us about your project, how you're working with your project to improve health. Um, and then everyone in the room will have a really good understanding of the five people that we've got here to share with us. And just, just a minute or two with this one, and we'll let you go a bit deeper and uh, longer with the next question. 
I'm going to ask, um, let's do alphabetical order, see if I can get the alphabetical order right, which would mean that Kath, with a C, you would go first. Thanks for being here. Thanks. Um, well, I just want to start by saying this is the most comfy presentation I've ever done. I'm currently in Ugg boots, so you can't really see. Um, very comfy. Uh, I am Kat. I work at the Western Bulldogs. I've been at the Western Bulldogs Community Foundation for the last four years. Uh, my role at the Bulldogs looks at impact and evaluation. So I essentially work with Victoria University to measure the impacts of all of our programs, not just Sons of the West. The foundation run um, a lot of different programs. So that's essentially my role, but I did start purely on the Sons of the West. So um, yeah, for the last four years, I have had that men's health um, background too. It's a little bit about me. Great. So um, thanks, Kat. Um, so I'm going to move next to, and thanks for being here. I'm going to move next to Dave Oliver. Dave, welcome. Hi everyone, thanks for having me. My name's Dave Oliver. Um, I am in the embryonic stage of developing a presentable resource for um, sporting clubs and uh, well, schools as well uh, with their sporting programs around sexuality and sport. Um, my, my lived experience and my backstory um, includes, and I'll talk a bit more about it in the next question, but includes coming to, uh, battling with coming to terms with my sexuality, having uh, been involved in the sport of rugby union mainly for most of my life. Uh, and how the um, the toxic shame um, that I experienced um, having to come to terms with my sexuality um, really caused some significant mental health issues and substance abuse issues for me. Um, and I'm hoping by uh, setting up a resource and sharing my lived experience, I'll be able to help some other, mainly men, uh, not go through uh, some of the battles that I had to. Cheers. Great. Thanks for being here, Dave. And thanks for joining us to share your personal story with us and what you're up to. Really appreciate it. Um, so next, uh, I guess it must be uh, Emma. Over to you. Thanks, Glenn. Um, I'm Emma George. So I'm a senior lecturer in health and physical education at Western Sydney Uni. Um, and I'm also the lead researcher on the Active Freed Men's Health Program, which is a collaborative program, um, which we work with the Canterbury Bankstown Bulldogs. Um, and my colleague Sari is online today. So hello, Sari, uh, one of our valued members of our team um, and the Southwestern Sydney Primary Health Network. So um, my background, I'm a bit of a glutton for punishment. I worked with men um, through my PhD and had a really hard time recruiting them. Um, but what I came to realize is that, you know, men, they do want to engage. We just need to make sure that we're providing um, the resources and, and the opportunities for them to really feel like they belong. Um, so we work with sport to use that as a vehicle to engage men for the promotion of healthy lifestyles, uh, but also for mental health and health literacy. Um, and I am a champion for men's health. I lost my dad when I was 20. Um, and so for me, I've dedicated my research to improving the physical and mental health of, of men since that point. Thanks. Uh, thanks for being here, Emma. And for, thanks for sharing your personal reasons to being uh, committed to this work. So next I come to, we come to Jake Edwards. Jake, welcome. Hey everyone, thanks for having me. Uh, my background is in AFL football. I spent uh, four years at the Carlton Football Club, so don't judge me on that. Um, I followed Geelong now. That's pretty good, hopefully, when we get back to playing sport. But I was the fifth player in my family to play league footy. Uh, it was a big thing of my life growing up. I was diagnosed with depression two years into my career, which ultimately transitioned our sport into everyday life as I knew it. It was a very difficult one. Uh, loss of identity, mental illness, which led me down drug and alcohol abuse, uh, which ultimately led me to an attempt on my life one, one day where I spent a time post that event in a rehab program. Uh, and that's where SL Locker Room was born off the back of that. And lived experience for the last five years, we've built the program. Uh, we're just about every, every state now across the country, um, federally funded in Western Australia, Queensland, New South Wales and Victoria. Uh, so we focus around welfare and, welfare and education for community sport in both uh, sport and schools as well. Uh, we run a welfare component, so we offer free immediate support for participants in the sport. They can reach out. We've got a welfare team made up of counsellors, psychologists that offer free immediate care plans and we help them connect with local services in their area and then we support that process for them individually. Uh, we On average, we, we have a free app that everyone downloads and people can talk to our welfare team through the app um, so on average, about 100 downloads, you identify about 25 people that are at high risk. 
um, and we support around 13 to 14 of that 25 going through challenges of mental health, drugs, alcohol, gambling, wide range of different challenges. So, and then we roll out an education program, which is two visits per sporting club and school per year, focusing predominantly around mental health. Uh, but we also offer other sessions around drugs, alcohol, gambling, inclusion, respect, uh, leadership and culture. So we do a quite a wide range of different programs. So yeah, that's us, about 300 sporting clubs and schools now uh, across the country. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Jake. Thanks for being here. Uh, thanks for giving us a, uh, an understanding of the breadth of the work you're doing. And, and thanks again for, uh, as, as with Emma, sharing the personal reasons that you got involved in this work. Okay. Right, thank you. Oh. Um, so last but not least, um, Timmy Duggan, thanks for being here, Timmy. Un just unmute there, Timmy. Yeah, Timmy Duggan, born and bred uh, Darwin, Darwin lad. Um, two components uh, to what I do at the moment. Um, one is the Hoops for Health program, which I founded uh, 20 years ago while I was playing uh, professionally with the Cairns Taipans in the NBL and uh, uses basketball as a, as a vehicle and done a lot of our work across Northern Australia and uh, currently go in on the weekends with the Dondale Youth Detention uh, Centre, which highly publicised Youth Detention Centre. Uh, every weekend for the last four years I've been in there and currently uh, trying to get some stuff on the outside so there's a bit of a pathway for these young men. 99% of the kids in there are men, 99% are young Indigenous uh, men. Um, I'm the first person from the Northern Territory to play in the National Basketball League and I'm one of only 18 in the history of 40 years of the National Basketball League to play in the NBL. Uh, the second, so I use a lot of my basketball experience. The second component is I'm currently um, managing a, a program with Anthony Mundine uh, called the Mindset of a Champ. And uh, we're on a bit of, we're gaining a bit of attraction before all the COVID stuff happened and three components to that program, uh, basically looking at mindsets, um, leadership and self-care. So using a lot of Anthony's um, inspirational narratives within that, that program. So yeah, that's me, Hoops for Health and the mindset of a champ. Timmy, thanks for being here. So um, I'll probably come back to you first, Timmy, for the second so set of questions, but I'll just sort of summarize what we've got so far. So yeah, we've got a nice spread across the country from the Northern Territory down to Victoria and, and including, uh, including New South Wales. We've got NRL, uh, rub, the proper rugby, rugby union, uh, AFL, basketball and, uh, and boxing as well. Thanks for bringing two codes to the conversation, Timmy. Um, we've got um, academics, we've got sports pros, we've got health project workers, we've got sports coaches. Uh, and we've got a heap of lived experience in the conversation as well. We've got enough knowledge and experience in this 75 minute chat to fill an entire conference. So we're really privileged to have you all here today. Uh, and I know five minutes isn't enough, but I'm going to ask you to take five minutes to really sort of at this part of the conversation, we just want to get a really sense of how, what, how do your projects work? How are you using sport? To, to reach men and work with men and, 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 and make a difference for men and boys in, in, in your community in particular. And on, on this round, I'm just going to weave my way down the country. So we'll start in the Northern Territory with, with, with Timmy. And I think you're Northern New South Wales, uh, Dave. So you'll be next and we'll work. We'll, we'll, I'll see how my geography goes and I'll, I'll get a map out and work it out. So about five minutes each this time. So over to you, um, Timmy, Tell, give us your best shot. Yeah, I guess for me, I'll start with my Hoops for Health stuff and the work I do in the Dondale Youth Detention Centre, how, how the sport um, help the kids and help and, and benefit the, the young people in there. Well, I go in there at a time at four o'clock in the afternoon um, on the weekends, on Saturday and Sunday. Lucky enough, there is a basketball court in there, so we have a venue. Um, and in the back of my head, I'm thinking... Well, we want the kids to have a good sleep. We want their minds right um, going to bed that night. So my whole idea is don't, the session is not too formal where it's working on a lot of skills stuff or, or teaching like that. It's more so to have a bit of fun and we're running around to, to work off that built up 
energy and, and anger or whatever they have going on. Um, it is at four o'clock in the afternoon in Darwin. So at that time of the day, it's, it's hot. It's an outside court. There's no air condition. Um, so it's, it's, it's pretty hot. And, um, and it goes for, for two hours. So come towards the end of the session, one of the things I highlight is success stories. Um, because I'm, the, the kids are constantly um, have a lot of negative in their life. So we'll have a big circle, like a yarning circle, and I'll come in with a celebration of success stories that they may not have heard of. Most times I will have an Aboriginal success story, whether it be a current one or one from the past. And I've highlighted the story of Marley and Pickett, who the extraordinary story of him playing in the grand final, coming from a youth detention um, background as well. Um, so that's one of them. And, and a lot of them, the learning is going on not only for the young people, but for the people that work with the young people on the inside. So they'll go to me, oh, we learned something today as well. Um, so that's, that's the stuff there in, in Dondale. It's, it's about knowing that 90% of these kids do have mental health issues. Um, but the basketball time that I'm in there is a time where it's less structured. I know during the week, they, they got programs going on. So if some young person wants to sit down in my session and just chill and watch, that's fine as well. They can do that because I know they're watching and then the next one or a week later, they're going to they're gonna join in. Um, and then, like I said, we'll finish with that. The big thing for me is, is using sport to develop the relationships uh, with the young people. Um, these young kids, for me, when I first went in there, I've been in there every weekend, 500 sessions for the last four years. Um, the first month or two was very hard. They didn't know me, even though I had family connections and a lot of kinship connections with these young people, they didn't know me. So the respect wasn't there, but now it's pretty easy um, for me um, going in there because the number one thing is the relationships with the young people. Um, if I quickly talk about, that's the Hoops for Health stuff, the stuff I'm doing with Anthony, um, it's all based on his inspirational narratives and keeping everything really positive. Um, and we've got a formal presentation that got, it's more than just a talk. We've got a presentation that accompanied with videos and leadership uh, concepts that um, is all based on positive psychology. Um, so we'll do it not only for men, uh, women, black, white, it doesn't matter. Um, and I'll see another side to Anthony that a lot of people, the media uh, will see or people will hear. Um, based on his inspirational narratives and his journey and stories that they can uh, relate to and pick up and not only use, not just for sport, but in the, in the workplace as well. Mm. And it's, it's really interesting because they got this guy as a three-time world champion in their room um, and he's, he's on, the, on the same level as, as these guys and, and talking about the experiences from his journey. Mm. That's great, Timmy. You've done an amazing job of packing all that information into, in, into, a, into a few minutes. Fantastic work you've been doing. Remind me, how, how long has the um, Hoops for Health been going now? Uh, I founded it back in 2001, but the concept I had in 1995, I've done a lot of work with the Aboriginal health sector. Mm -hmm. uh, so I combined my two kind of passions, which is the Aboriginal health and basketball, and that's therefore Hoops, Hoops for Health. Mm. Right. And you know, uh, my good mate, Jason Bonson up at the Darwin Indigenous Men's Service? Yep, I do know Jason. Yep. And I think he is the one that connected us um, to get, get myself on here today. So. Yeah, well, I thank him for that. It's uh, great to make the connection. Fantastic to have you here, Timmy. Yep. No worries. Likewise. Yeah, nice one. Okay. Well, next, we're going to travel quite, quite a way via Mount Isa across the, uh, across the Gulf Savannah, just completely bypassing Queensland and down to, uh, down to, down to Newcastle. <coughs> Dave Oliver, over to you, sir. You've got your five minutes. Thanks, Glenn. Um, yeah, so look, I, I suppose I, I should preface this by um, explaining to everyone that uh, my resource is not up and, and, and running at, at this particular stage. There's some significant interest, which is great. Um, so I, I may um, just share with you 
um, a little bit about my lived experience in why I think this is important uh, and how it relates back to men's mental health and sport. Um, I'm, I would have to be probably the closest to one of, uh, it, when you hear the story, a, a poster child for how things can go horribly wrong um, if, um, if we don't get this right. Um, especially in hyper-masculine, uh, hyper-heterosexual um, um, sporting landscapes uh, when it comes down to really and truly um, honouring the fact that we need to make these spaces inclusive of all. But uh, where, where I think my niche is, is, is sharing that story about, um, <laughs> about having to, to, to be ashamed of your sexuality. Um, it was a debilitating situation for me. I'm 39 years of age now. Um, I only really sort of, well, not really, I officially, whatever the, the, the process is that you call it, uh, came out um, as gay um, or same-sex or bisexually attracted um, in my early 30s. Um, there's a significant chunk of time there where uh, substance use and abuse, um, the real binge drinking, binge substance, substance usage um, culture that I learnt um, growing up in regional Australia, uh, watching my father um, and all his mates participate in the local rugby club um, and the, um, the learned behaviours that I learnt there about, uh, you know, play hard and party hard. Uh, that then extended to um, many years playing rugby union in Sydney in the eastern or for eastern suburbs rugby club. Where, um, you know, and when I look back at it now, having just spent a significant amount of time as well working for the Alcohol and Drug Foundation, um, I now know that, uh, that, that there's a lot of masks being worn uh, out there in, in, in sporting world and, and especially in the men's um, sporting clubs. And uh, it actually sends shivers down my spine, um, really now having a, a good grasp on, on what uh, I've been through um, and, and the masks that I wore to survive. Um, I've, I've been through acute care, through a rehab uh, program. And um, um, I now have a really good understanding of what was going on for me, um, deep down to my soul about the type of person that I, I wanted to be and become, but actually what was happening for me mentally and, and the undoing. Um, I'm very lucky that, incredibly lucky that I have the support networks that I had in place. Um, because I don't think I could have been one of the ones that may not may not may not be here, um, and it's a really hard thing to say. I'm, I'm actually volunteer on the phones for Lifeline, and I find I find um, when I'm talking to callers, um, quite often one of the big talking points that I get to um, um, with with people who are in crisis is they talk about this disconnection that they've had in their life from and a lot because we are a sporting nation. Um, a lot of um, a lot of people talk about um, when they're just ruminating on their life experience and, and how they've gotten to this point of crisis. They'll be talking about um, about how I don't play sport anymore. I don't do those things that I used to do. That hobby, um, and and it really hammered the, that home for me as well. That that I, I need to do this. I need to get out there and make sure that as many as many men as possible um, remain in sport for for their lifetime, uh, not just as a participant. Uh, when you cross that white line to get on the field, but also to remain um, in, in LinkedIn and, and tied to their sports clubs because it's such a key part to, to feeling um, productive and connected in life and, and, and keeping your mental health in check. So, so to that end, I suppose it's, uh, it's all about the two big sides to my resources. One is to share in the lived experience of what Toxic Shame does. And I really want to shine the light on that and just explain to people in, in a safe way. Um, and I've got a, a, a nice team of people that, have agreed to help me to, to develop it in a safe way to talk about what that looks like for people. Um, and, 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 and then the other side is then now we've heard that story. Um, can we all agree uh, that, that we would like our sporting club to be a safe space for, for people who uh, consider themselves, uh, sorry about the noise, um, uh, who consider themselves to be um, on the sexuality spectrum, we'll call it. So, so yeah, so two sides to it. Um, um, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to, to what the future holds. Uh, it's not something I'm doing full time. I, I have, I haven't, I'll have other things going on, but um, it'll grow organically and um, it's a powerful message. And I really hope it's my, uh, my life goal to get out there and get in front of, in front of as, as many men in particular as possible, to let them know that they, uh, they're more than welcome to, to, you know, that they're worthy, that they're lovable um, and, and that they should remain playing sport and, and being involved in their sporting clubs for their lifetime. Thank you.
Great, great work, Dave. Really looking forward to seeing how that unfolds and uh, looking forward to hearing more of your story and your contribution to this uh, important conversation today. Um, so uh, I think we're at Sydney now. Emma, over to you. Yeah, and I just wanted to say thanks, Dave, for sharing all of that. I think what you're doing is incredible and I you know, can't wait to see it actually getting out there and getting across to all of the sporting clubs. So well done. Um, so Active Breed, I'm going to talk about today. Um, it's a 12-week men's health program. It's really holistic. So we recognise that physical health is incredibly important, especially as men start to kind of get into their middle ages. Um, so we target men aged 35 to 64. Uh, but we've also recognised pretty pretty much across the nation, but especially in Southwest Sydney, mental health is a huge issue. Um, and we know that based on some of the research that the Southwest Sydney Primary Health Network have done, um, men aren't really engaging with formal mental health services in the region. So for us, we knew that these were some sort of really key health priorities that we wanted to target through our program. So these were the, the health and social needs of our community. Um, and the Bulldogs are the family club. And so they really do care about their community. So for us, it was a perfect match in terms of coming together um, and bringing on some other partners that sort of shared our vision. So every week, men come into the Bulldogs Inner Sanctum at Belmore Sports Ground, and they have full access to the club. So the first grade gym, um, the oval, we change things up every week, uh, but each session goes for 90 minutes. The first 45 minutes is usually an education session, which is delivered either by our active breed coaches or by local health experts. Um, and for us, engaging local health experts with expertise in men's health, um, in mental health and in, and in healthy relationships and domestic violence in particular was really important to us because we recognise these as issues. Um, but we also knew that if we could give men access to these experts and reliable health information, that was a really powerful way for them to really take charge of their health. So we do target physical activity and nutrition, but we don't use any strict exercise regimes or diets because we want to make sure that what our men are doing is going to be sustainable beyond the scope of the 12 week program. Our um, health information sort of encourages men to engage with health professionals, have conversations with their GPs, um, go and get checkups for their blood pressure. So we start those conversations there and encourage them to continue um, outside of, of the space of the football club. And we really try to create a sense of camaraderie and, and really being part of the active breed family from week one. And I think that's so important in terms of building a space that is supportive and encouraging and, and makes men feel comfortable. So from week one, what happens at Belmore stays at Belmore, but above everything else, um, we emphasize respect. And that's respect for the club, the history of the club, the players that have come before them, but also respect for each other. So it's about looking at ways that you can look out for your mates. Um, it's about recognizing signs and symptoms of depression and poor mental health, uh, but also looking at ways that you can build a culture of respect in the community and really um, build healthy relationships with your partner, with your children, um, with your mates. So we do tackle some pretty confronting topics, um, but this, the fact that it is done within that environment of the sports club where men come in from week one and there's a common thread um, almost all of them are Bulldog supporters. We did have a Manly supporter. Anyone that knows NRL knows that Manly is the absolute enemy. Um, so the guys gave him a bit of grief, but then they were pretty quick to welcome him in, into the group as well. Um, but really, we really do try and build that sense of, of mateship and camaraderie. And for us, that's where the success is really, um, has really been shown. We've also engaged with men's partners and kids. So after they participate in the program, they engage in some focus groups. Um, but listening to, to some of their partners talking about how open they are in terms of discussing mental health or the improved relationships they've now got with their children, um, for us, that kind of exceeded all of our expectations. We knew that what we developed was pretty special. We put a lot of time into developing this program. Um, but to see the impact that that's had and the spillover effect it's had for their families has been really heartening and something that we're really proud of. So that's a little bit about Active Breed. Uh, I'm sure we'll talk a little bit more about how we can use sport to try and engage men more. But really for us, it's about capitalising on that passion for rugby league, um, especially in Western Sydney, which is rugby league heartland, uh, and engaging men through that passion. And then once we get them in, having those important conversations about how they can improve their health.
Great work, Emma. Um, I'm, I'm almost nervous to admit that the only, um, the only NRL game I've been to is the Brookvale Oval because um, I used to live in uh, used to live in in uh, in Harbord. So um, just don't yeah, mention no. that again. <laughs> well, okay. I'm not. I, I must. I'm not a fan. <laughs> of Manly or of rugby league? No, I'm learning rugby league. But, okay, yeah, fine. No, but not, not 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 no. I wasn't a great fan of Manly either. Perfect. Yeah, You'll be right. get the next game, Glenn. <laughs> it started. <laughs> Okay, so we're going to um, go all the way down to Victoria now. I, I'm not going to work out who's the most northern. I'm just going to go. Um, I'm just going to go girl boy girls. So Jake, would you go first, and then uh, and then Cap brings us home. Jake. Oh yeah, absolutely. Happy to do that. Hey, Thanks. hey, Cat. How are you? Hi, I'm doing good. How are you, Jake? Going good, thank you. We've uh, we've worked together in the past, everyone. So. Definitely not. Just thought I'd get in there and say hello to you. Um, yeah, I guess it's terrific to hear everyone's story and journey. Um, I can say to to Dave, mate, what you're doing is fantastic as well. I, mean, I was you five years ago, mate. Had an idea, really passionate about getting something going, and then it's quite remarkable when you get some momentum and passion towards it because um, things can actually grow quite quickly. And if there's anything that we can do as an organisation, please reach out. More than happy to support any mentoring you might need along the way in that early challenging part of starting up an organization as it, as it can be. Uh, outside of the locker room, I kind of touched on a little bit early on, so I'll keep it kind of really brief, but the areas we focus on and why sport's such a huge vehicle for us is essentially, um, I identified this five years ago, especially a lot of rural areas around the country where sport's a vehicle that brings everyone together. Most areas around the country, um, especially you know, rural areas, you know, people shut down work and everyone goes to the football or sport on the weekends. It's generally a great, a great hub. And no matter your background, whether your, you know, your religion, you know, your, your sex, your, your gender, whatever it might be, sport brings everyone together. And we utilize that platform to really get out and engage with the community. And, and sport for us is, a, is the best vehicle to do that. Uh, our sessions that we run are delivered by community people. Uh, we have a very in-depth facilitator program where we screen people who we put through a, a training um, course, which generally goes around at 12 months, uh, where we get them up to skills to roll out our education program. I feel and we feel this works really successfully because they they become staff of ours, so they're casual employees. So we, we obviously support them along the way in the journey, but they're local people delivering local programs to local sport. Uh, and that's where that real connectiveness, whether they're, we have men and female who deliver our program. Uh, and that seems to be a really great way for us to build that rapport, trust and impact through that local community. Uh, we're not coming on the outside, coming in. Uh, we train up people in the local areas, which has been a real great success for us uh, as well. We have a welfare champion program, which so every education session we run all the way across the country. Uh, we don't run it unless we have a welfare champion in the room. So these are once again, screened uh, mental health and uh, mental health professionals. So counsellors and psychologists that are in there in the room on the night or the day for the education session in case something's triggered. Uh, people can have conversations, you know, before, during or after our sessions uh, and just to make sure that everyone is safe in those environments that we do create. Because as mentioned uh, earlier by Emma, we, we talk about some pretty confronting things and we rely a lot on the humanistic side of mental health, sharing stories through our facilitators, which is generally people who come to us who want to get involved because they've been through lived experience with mental health. So a big part of that training is teaching them how to, how to do that safely in those sporting club environments. The biggest thing is probably now where we started off uh, five years ago, me, I was getting around doing a lot of that work. And now as we've grown, uh, I think we're now we've got nearly 60 odd facilitators around the country. We rely quite heavily on sporting clubs participating with our program, but the other part of it as well, we're finding we're more heading towards the direction now of research and data uh, in supporting um, PHNs of the world and other um, government funded organizations to really piggyback off us with our data we collect through our app, uh, which you know supports evidential uh, work for us moving forward. Uh, so we're in the process at the moment, we've engaged with a, a research company called Evaluate who support government with policy uh, so they'll be coming on board and the Australian Public Affairs as well, helping us support that narrative around our program data collection and what we're identifying through our program because we've got about 6,000 people that have downloaded our app over the last 
18 months. Uh, and there's a lot of great information we, we collect through there, which supports our program development as, uh, as well, which is obviously moving forward. We want to make sure we're delivering on the right touch points uh, for community, especially young men. We target anywhere from 13 and up, but predominantly it's around 21 to 32 years of age, which uh, go through our program. And yeah, it's just a great vehicle sport, isn't it? It just brings us all together. and something we use, we use really, really well. So our program um, will continue to grow hopefully and uh, get out to more sporting clubs over the next, next few years, which is, which is exciting. So yeah. right. Great work, Jake. Thanks for, uh, thanks for giving us a bit more depth and detail about um, what you're doing, what you've been doing and what's emerging now. Um, so Kat, and last but not least. Thank you. Um, it's been really interesting to hear um, from the previous presenters. I think there's a mountain of work going on um, with men and it's fantastic to see the diversity. Um, Emma's, pro Emma's um, program sound quite similar to the Sons of the West program. So just a really high level overview. It's a 10 week men's health program for men over 18 um, of all cultural backgrounds, of all walks of life. It's super accepting. Um, we do run it all over west of Victoria. So we have 14 locations. We're not just solely based out at V Witten Oval. We, unlike Emma's program, we actually find that only about 20% of our Sons of West participants are Bulldogs fans. So we've seen the power of sport not only draw together men who are football fans, but men who have no idea what AFL is, and even men who don't follow the Bulldogs. We have Carlton supporters, uh, Geelong supporters, we have Essendon supporters, it doesn't really matter. We find that the brand in itself is so powerful for bringing people together. Um, I was just wondering if I can quickly screen share a photo. Is that all right? Um, Glenn, can I quickly screen? No. Nope. Give right. me a second. I'll probably just have to make you a, a, a host. A, a, if it's too tricky, no worries. I just want to read out something that uh, one of our participants shared with me. On the wrong, no, I've just made the wrong person a co-host. Hang on a second. I've got you. Okay. Uh, make co-host. Yeah, go now. Thank you. Perfect. Radio. So, just want to read out something for you. Can everyone see that? Yeah. That, yeah, great. That is Uncle Tony. So, Uncle Tony is, um, oh, sorry, I think so. One of our sons of the West participants um, and Uncle Tony's done three years of the program and he told me that because of the sons of the West program where we encouraged him to go and get a GP check he would actually noticed that in the past he'd had a heart attack so he'd had chest pain for maybe three months his wife was at him to go to the doctor come on Tony get off your backside go to the doctor he said no no I'm fine I'm fine still had that little bit of chest pain as soon as he came to Sons of the West, we offered him a ticket to go to the football. Um, wasn't any special ticket, it was general admin, but it was with all the other guys. Um, so he went to the doctor. The doctor did a bank of tests. He did 13 tests in total. And within that, he found out that he had diabetes, that in the past he'd had a heart attack, that one of his uh, arteries to his heart was completely blocked. And within two days, he was in the hospital um, getting some stents inserted to block that completely um, blocked artery. And that was all because of a football ticket, all because of um, a program which was using sport to draw him in. Um, and it promoted something that seems a relatively simple thing that if you've got chest pain, you should probably go to the doctors. Um, but no, it was a football ticket in the end that got him to go to the doctors and potentially saved his life. So. Yeah, I don't, I don't think there's a better example of the power of sport to, to try and help men with their health. But the program isn't just around um, physical health. We also have a really large component around mental health. As um, Jake had mentioned, it's really important um, to, to cover that holistic approach. And we also work closely with psychologists and provisional psychologists and have provisional psychologists at every session of our program. That enables men who maybe have never thought about going to seek mental health support to build rapport with someone um, and actually have a connection then and there. So no barriers. We're trying to break down some of those barriers to healthcare. They don't have to wait. They can um, have an ease of access straight through our Victoria University Clinic partnership. 
and they have someone on site to talk to as well. So we're not only just around um, engaging people and educating, but we're also about trying to break down some of those barriers as well. Great. A little bit of a snapshot. Yeah, no, great, great, great work. I've actually been out to the stadium, met one of your colleagues. Uh, and I remember yeah. hearing particularly about the, uh, the program with uh, culturally and linguistically, linguistically diverse men who didn't even really yeah. know what AFL was, but many, you managed to engage, I don't know, 40, 50 blokes from those communities in Melbourne. Yeah, since 2000, so our program's been going on since 2016, and we've had over 3,000 men um, come through the program. And we try, for those who maybe aren't Victorian based, we are in the west of Victoria, which is an extremely multicultural region. And we're super lucky to have that diversity. So we do really try hard to mirror the diversity of the community um, by having cultural diversity within the Sons of the West too. Great. So we've got from those, um, thanks Kat, we've got from those, uh, uh, our five speakers, already uh, an, an example of an amazing range of both work that's been done, work that they're doing, and work that just in their programs, if they just continued doing what they were doing, um, would make a fantastic difference, right? So then this part of the question really speaks to the, the question of the whole session, which is, you know, we've still got issues like men dying six years younger than women on average. We've got issues like um, suicide with three and four suicides a men and six in eight, six, six men die by suicide every day. We've got um, uh, even bigger health issues within indigenous communities, um, got issues around violence, around imprisonment, uh, crime, uh, education for boys actually right at the start of life. Um, fathers facing challenges, a whole range of, uh, of, of issues that we could take on in, in society. And so a, a sport, if we just take one message from today, it's clear that sport is a fantastically good vehicle to engage effectively with, with, with men and boys. So this is, my, this is my question to each of you. And uh, Dave, I'll come to you first and then Emma to give you a bit of a heads up. So the question is, I'm not even going to say could sports do more. I'm going to assume they. I'm, sure, I'm going to assume sports could, right? I'm going to assume sports could. So, what more could sport do? And um, that's sports clubs. Um, that's different sports codes, uh, and even like you know community sports clubs. Uh, what what more could sport do to improve the lives and the health of men and boys in in, in Australia? Dave, you go first. Thanks, Glenn. Um, from my perspective, specifically regarding what I'm hoping to achieve with my resource, um, and, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll shoot it a bit. We're getting up for one or two minutes on this one. Is that what it was? Oh, yeah, two, two to three, we'll say. So you've got a little minutes. bit of time okay. to shoot it over. Okay. Um, well, look, it's, it's obvious, um, very obvious with sexuality and sport, um, that, that, that sports, NSOs, your, your general run-of-the-mill community sporting clubs, um, have quite a bit of work ahead of them. We have gone in leaps, come in leaps and bounds as a society, uh, obviously around sexuality, uh, sexuality and the um, the um, the plebiscite recently, um, and that's a fantastic thing. But uh, and, and and we're talking a lot about men's sport here today, um, and and it, it is very appropriate that um, we talk about sexuality because. Uh, you know, in this in this particular world, we we, we look at uh, we look at mentors, we look at different players that we can look up to, um, and that's what a lot of young young men and young boys do. And, and we don't have at this stage an, an openly gay um, wallaby or, or waratah or any professional rugby union player in Australia. Just talking about my sport, um, and I think most of the other codes here in Australia would 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 be able to say the same thing and not be very proud about it. Um, and that means that there is a significant amount of men right at the moment in a very, very poor mental health cycle. Um, it is, um, you know, to shed some light on toxic shame, it is, people think, oh, is it a bit like sort of anxiety and depression? And I say, well, you know, if depression, depression's sort of a, an issue with what's happened in the past of anxieties being scared a bit about the future. You know, toxic shame is, 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 you, you, you think that you are wrong, uh, that you are disordered, um, that you are that you are not worthy. And if we're talking about an opportunity, if we, if this forum's talking about how do we make 
sporting organisations better, well, we have to not have any participant that feels that way about themselves. Um, that is the key thing, that they must be, uh, that, that the environment that they're participating in, if we talk about um, a cat's experience, about that ticket, you know, was that, that chance for that gentleman to, to find his way to a better, uh, a better life, I'll tell you that those same tickets, those same membership forms, um, can be a huge problem. Um, having worked at the Alcohol and Drug Foundation um, and substance abuse and misuse is something I'd like to do as well eventually, I'll tell you that there are many, many sporting clubs and organisations in Australia that are not protective factors um, for, for their participants. Um, one example, the rugby club that I was associated with at general manager level, I had a, a father um, come down from the country um, and he threatened to kill all of us um, for, you know, because he'd found out that his son had picked up a cocaine habit uh, participating in this particular amateur rugby union club. And he had. Um, there was nothing we could do to defend it. Um, uh, and, and that had gone on. And it was, um, it was incredibly disheartening for me to think that that had gone on and under our watch it, it, that everyone was like, well, you know, sporting clubs are a microcosm of society. Well, that's not a good enough excuse anymore. It just isn't. Um, it, it's not even an excuse. We have to be better in this space. So I think that's where the opportunity lies, um, is, to, is to one, uh, make sure that we are generally inclusive. And the term that I'm sort of using myself, uh, I really want to step up on the shoulders of, of those giants that have gone before me um, in the, as part of the rainbow community, the LGBTQI legends, absolute legends. I'd love to, to, to remove the stigma and remove the need for us to have to identify with any colour or any rainbow or anything. We just need to make our sporting clubs inclusive, uh, genuinely inclusive. Um, and that's, that's, that's basically where I think the opportunity lies. Cheers. That's uh, really powerful, um, Dave. And um, you know, inclusivity is about everyone, right? It's like, clearly you're going to barrack for your, 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 from your experience and from the communities you feel most able to, to, to represent. Um, but we, we talk a lot about the power of sport to engage men effectively because men already because men are already there and men already love sport. But then that's not everyone. I mean, this morning we were talking about how Manly Fat Soccer Club engages overweight men who didn't feel included in other sports clubs because they were overweight. So, in, you know, inclusivity is, is about so many things. It's not just about sexuality. It's not just about um, it's not just about about, about race. There are, uh, sport is a fantastic um, in, uh, tools for reaching men, but clearly we need to do more to embrace men and boys in all their diversity, however we define that diversity. And I think what you're doing, um, using your experience to make a difference is, uh, is bloody awesome, mate. So thank you. So um, I would just like to kind of mirror everything that Dave's just said there. I think um, creative in creating inclusive spaces is incredibly important so that people feel like they do belong. And I think that feeling like you belong to a team or a club or a family can be so, so powerful in terms of actually opening up and, and really looking at how you can become the best version of yourself. So I, I will just add a couple of things to that, I think, um, so that we can move on to our other speakers as well. But I think in terms of professional sporting organisations, we've seen some amazing examples of what some clubs are doing and, and organisations that they're engaging with to make sure that their fans are being included and, and they are delivering really important health and social messages. But I think that there are a lot of clubs who probably underestimate the power that they actually have in the community. So when we take our participants from Active Breed out onto the, you know, the hallowed turf of Belmore to have a game of touch footy with one of the club legends, they are just beside themselves with excitement. And, you know, it's such a simple thing, just opening up the facilities and actually making them feel like they belong to the club. They're part of something bigger and they are really part of that family. Um, is incredibly important. And I think that that's probably an underutilized resource that we could probably tap into a little bit more. So really opening up and engaging fans, not just to get bums on seats, but to actually make meaningful changes in the community. And I think it's also really important for us to note that sport is this incredible tool. It's this vehicle that brings people together. Um, as Jake was saying, regardless of your background, regardless of, of your culture, your sex, if you support the same club, um, or if you support a, a particular code, you kind of have this mutual understanding and give each other a bit of a nod of, you know, acknowledgement that, you know, you, you're doing something right. So I think that using sport to get men in 
is really important, but it's about the environment that you create once they are in that keeps them coming back. And so that is about safety. It's about respect. Um, it's about empowering men to make the right decisions, to, to really kind of go above and beyond and become champions for men's health in their own societies. That's great, Anna. Thanks for that. Uh, thanks for that contribution that contribution and for that ongoing focus that you have on that not just about the individual men but about building the the healthy environment through working with the men which is uh, yeah which obviously is, is is an important part of making um making sports inclusive um so timmy um well what what, what what do you reckon on this one and are there any particular as well when you're going through this any particular you know issues that you'd really like to see addressed Address through. Yeah. yeah, there's a few. Obviously, if we're talking about, for me, it's working with those young kids in the Donda using basketball as the vehicle, um, celebrating success. They're in four walls, so it's constantly giving them positive um, success stories, realizing that their their brains are still developing as a young person, so they have a chance to um, implement some some type of change. So when they when they get out. Um, like most people, and as the previous speakers have mentioned, they do want some structure to their life and being part of something and, um, and belonging to something. So um, we're looking at starting some programs there and it might sound elitist, but at the end of the day, these kids genuinely want to get better. If they come into the sessions, they genuinely want to get better at whatever they're, they're trying. And in this case happens to be Aboriginal young men um, I coined a term uh, two years ago at a Basketball Australia Coaches Conference called cultural safety in basketball. And it's all about the ability to reflect mm -hmm. as a coach, as an association, um, as a peak body in sport and having that ability, have that self-awareness and reflect on what you're doing good and what you need to, uh, to improve on. And I think that's a big key trait to be leaders in in the field is that ability to reflect. And I guess the final thing, I'll, I'll finish with an excerpt out of, um, on this topic, on reflecting, Sir Alex Ferguson, you know, um, out of his book, he went up to Aberdeen in Scotland and there was a group of young men um, up there that he was going to recruit. And one of the young boys was smoking a cigarette and he walked over to one of the young boys uh, with the assistant coach of Man U, and he's got AF emblazoned down the side of his shirt, you know, I'm Sir Alex Ferguson, here I am. And one of the young kids was smoking a cigarette, and he walked over to him and said, put that, put that cigarette out right, right now, young man. And the young boy looked at him and goes, who the hell are you? And I can't do it with my hands, what he, what he actually did to Alex Ferguson, but basically told him to go and shove it. Yeah. And, but what Alex Ferguson did from that was, reflected on that moment uh, with his assistant coach and on how we recruit these young persons. But the main story was, we don't even know these young people. Yeah. We need to walk a mile in their shoe, um, reflect when we recruit. So we can't just tell them to stop smoking without knowing their journey or their story, as some of the previous speakers have spoken about before. So that's what they did in their recruitment process after that was, ensure that they um, walked a mile in the young person's, young men's shoes uh, before any program started. Hmm. Yeah. No. But yeah, I, I implement a lot of that within my, that self-reflection on the ability to reflect. Yeah, that's, uh, that's really powerful um, to me because I can instantly see that, you know, obviously you were talking about the clear difference you're making in, 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 your, in your local area with the guys you actually work with, but there you're talking about being a leader within your code. Um, and it's not just for your community because if those principles are applied in, 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 in one code well, that's about all communities, right? That's not just about cultural safety and basketball for Aboriginal people. That's cultural that's safety and basketball for all of us, right? Yeah, and I, I think as most coaches, that's what you do. You, you do it anyway. You reflect on your performance on how to improve better. So here's another, mm. it, it, it's, it's, it should be part of your psyche anyway to yeah. reflect on how you, you interact with people. Mm. 
And so then if we expand that out further, what we're looking for then is culturally, cultural safety in all sports for everyone. Exactly, yeah. yeah. And as I mentioned before, everyone's alluded to that in some form or another already. Yeah, yeah we're, we're, we're telling the same story from it, we're using different language from a different perspective by the sounds of it. Yes, uh, really powerful. Thanks, Tim. So um, I'll come to you next, Kat, and then Jake to, to bring us home on this. What are your thoughts, Kat? Yeah, I think I'd just like to echo some of the um, thoughts that have been shared before. But I think, um, so I'm previously an occupational therapist by background. So I trained um, and did a little bit of work in the acute setting. And um, starting at the Bulldogs, I was amazed at how the Bulldogs can bring together 800 to 1,000 men for a health program, yet a health service struggles for that engagement piece. So I think yeah, sport codes in general cannot underestimate how powerful that ability to engage people and get people through the door is. And then once you've done that, have that sense of being able to advocate for really important issues, but then connect and link. Don't just use the voice to advocate on an issue without then taking action. And I think that taking action piece is really, really important for sporting codes to use right from um, national levels to grassroots. Uh, I think, again, it's important to be inclusive and, and demonstrate that inclusiveness. The Bulldogs' mission, so the Western Bulldogs' mission as a football club is to create memories that connect and inspire our people and our community. I think football clubs and other sporting crews need to look at having missions that are wider than just performance-based because at the end of the day, sport is a national icon and it has power that, you know, should be capitalized on it and so to actually embed that in a mission statement is pretty important as well and they're just my my takes on it excellent yeah and i really um really take your point there about the um the extraordinary ability to um of sports clubs to engage to engage men but then you see that's that's true of lots of really good men's health projects and this is one of the things that you know we as the men's health sector have been saying for many years that um that men will engage with certain projects. It's just that they don't necessarily engage with, with health services. And yeah, of course, men have got to grow and develop and improve and there's, we could always do better, but we, we, a big focus of what we do is to get health services to stop saying, how can we change men? Uh, and start thinking, well, how can we change our approach? Because- uh, That's just one other point that I forgot to mention is around partnerships. Mm -hmm. So the Bulldogs Community Foundation, we don't deliver the programs ourselves in terms of we're not the only staff members, we work in partnership and it's so powerful to have more than one organisation coming together. So yes. sporting creds and clubs should really look at partnering with other organisations to promote messages. Yeah, no, that's a great approach. And you, so you all bring a bit of resource to the table and together you're great in some of the parts, right? Yeah, if we don't have to keep reinventing the wheel, um, you've got this amazing resource, your brand, your ability to build a relationship and they, these other health services and projects have already got knowledge and wisdom and expertise around particular health issues and re referral pathways and all the rest of it. Yeah, that's, yeah, good. Excellent. Uh, so Jake, uh, last but not least, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, everyone's covered off in really important areas. I'm not too much I can really add except a couple really think are the important points to make is uh, another role that sport does play in a, for everyone to get a, a probably a bit more of a, how would I put this, a bit more of a, a reality check on the flip side of sport and the impact that it can play is that over last weekend, uh, not, not one just gone, sorry, the weekend before, we had three sporting clubs contact us Monday morning off the back of a suicide in their community. Um, so generally what happens is the first point of call is the school, you know, family, obviously school, then the sporting club. And we have a lot of sporting clubs coming to us far too often. We had something like 20, I think it's 24 clubs last year come to us off the back of a suicide that's happened in their community. And the volunteers who run our sporting clubs that are mum and dads who aren't equipped or skilled for bereavement um, processes, uh, they're coming to us more, more often. Um, they'll go to a sporting code, the leagues, and the leagues are saying go to outside the locker room. Uh, we had to develop a um, postvention pack about four months ago for the – I don't like it, but it's the uh, the likely uh, event of suicides happening in our community and the impact it has into our sporting clubs in supporting that process as well. 
Um, so that is a, 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 another clear indication of, the, of sport and the impact it can have on men's, men's health in the community. The other part of it also is never more so than ever has community sport been ready for programs that we've all just spoken about. Five years ago when I developed our sort of locker room, there wasn't anything or any of these things around. Uh, as we can see, the conversation has got to a point where the awareness is really starting to break down and people are, are looking for help. We've seen a cultural shift through sport and that involves our parents that are ones who are leading the sporting clubs, generally having more of a, a younger generation of parent coming through those community roles that are 35 to 50 years of age, who have young men around the ages of 13 to 17 years of age playing sport or in the community or involved in sport. The mum and dads are seeing the problems and challenges at home and they're not naive to the impact that that's going to correlate into the community and sporting club. Uh, we more so than ever have sporting clubs coming to us looking for support, help, direction, want to be proactive, want to be doing something in the community uh, because they see the impact that their sporting club can have and almost like a responsibility that they feel uh, that they can play a really important narrative in supporting men's health in their communities. So partnerships, as Kat mentioned, is very, very important for programs to be successful um, in regions and communities across uh, Australia um, and it's really really important we focus on working together and not against each other uh, to try and get that outcome that we're all trying to achieve every single one of us has spoke about a program uh, that we're all moving in the same direction there's a, a lot of power in coming together and using our resources to really strengthen that impact uh, in community sport uh, as well so there's a couple of things there that I know we see through our program um, you know that we, we get clubs coming to us uh, on both sides the impact unfortunate event of suicide and then the kind of pickup that sporting clubs have to play uh, which again they're volunteers and it's a very very difficult conversation environment to support and then there's the other side where we do have more clubs being looking to be proactive and wanting to have something as part of their sporting club to support their their culture so there are a couple of things that I can add I guess to the yeah that next kind of wave of what could potentially be coming. Great. That's excellent, um, Jake. So this has been fascinating. I can't believe how the time has, uh, has, has flown. Uh, we've got um, 10 minutes left of this official session. I'm going to come to the audience now. And then before I might come back to the, um, to all our speakers for a sort of a last call to call to action. Um, so a um, couple of ways we can do this. Uh, you can, um, you can, I can, Call out names that I see. You can uh, click on the participants icon at the bottom of Zoom and, and raise a hand there. You can post a comment in the, the, the chat box, or you can try waving madly um, on your video and hope, hope, hoping that you're seen. Quickest way is to just raise a hand using the, part, the participants box. But I did notice someone uh, posted a comment here. Let's see what it was about, um, about alcohol, I think it was, and Mad Mondays. Um, Shirepod, is Shirepod still in the room? Um, if you're, you're here, you want to turn your mic on and, uh, yay, we're getting away from Shirepod. Do you want to, do you want to sort of make the point yourself in your own voice? Uh, yeah, so I come from a, um, a policing background and I studied basically, um, focused on alcohol and crime and a lot of our issues came from the sporting arena. Um, especially the spike and the encouragement to drink around sporting events. Um, just public ones, but also local ones as well that uh, sort of filtered out into the community. A lot about, you know, driving home after the sport, you've had a few drinks, accidents, that sort of being overindulging, and especially around the celebrations as well. So I was just wondering if there was, uh, that was being addressed at this level as well. Right. Okay. We'll come back to that. You, have you got a real name you want to share with us? Yeah, I'm Paula. Hey, so, Paula. Yeah, I'm a podcast, I, I do, I'm a podcast producer. So Yeah. So it's, come, it's come through this email for some reason. <laughs> now, good to see you, Paula. Thanks for being here. We'll no check out your Shire pod. Yes, um, thank you. Yeah. Sydney, thank Sydney. You. Sydney? Yeah, we're in Sydney. Awesome. Okay. So uh, I'm going to just come for a couple more audience comments and then we'll, we'll, we'll bounce back to the, uh, the panel if they want to pick up any of these points. Uh, I see uh, Josh Tree's got his hand up. Josh, do you want to introduce yourself and uh, let us know what you've got to say? Hi, uh, Josh. Um, works deals by trying to work on um, seven clips for this mic and uh, directly uh, relates to the issue. Uh, 
I'm just going to mute you there. Maybe drop your point in the chat box because you're sounding like a Dalek. Um, for those who know Doctor Who, unfortunately, I think your connection is really bad, Josh. Uh, or maybe try to turn your camera off and um, and just using the audio, and we'll give you one more go. Otherwise, I'm going to have to ask you to drop the uh, drop the point in the in, in the chat box, and we'll read it read it out for you. Um, so, um, Josh, do you want to try another go with just the microphone? Should I mute yourself? No, still not, still not good. Well, drop, drop the, no, still not good. Drop the comments in the um in in the chat box, and we'll read it out. Good to see you, Josh. Sorry, we're just not we're just not hearing you at all. Um, just gonna have a look for, around the room for a couple more people. I put my poor Peacock, who was our lunchtime speaker. Do you, have you got any reflections on the uh, on on this session you'd like to share? Um, yeah, yeah look, I. I I agree with, with Jake. There's, there's so many people doing such great work in this space. Um, bouncing back, we we had to put together a post pension plan as well for um, for when um, players had taken their own lives. I think one of the other challenges is I wrote it in the in the site in the um, comments. There is especially for community sporting groups, duty of care is a real concern for them. It's how much they're willing to take on and what responsibilities they're willing to take on for their players and their players' families. Um, and we've, we've had that. So when, when we've had, you know, um, K-10s come back that, that showed, you know, X amount of players um, really struggling, we've had some clubs then completely shut down um, because then they, they don't know what to do. Um, so I think it's through the COVID-19, we've noticed a lot that, you know, a lot of... Um, uh, community sporting clubs are run by small business owners. So um, even at the start of COVID, I was I was working with a club who um, two of the coaches had already lost their jobs. So three months later, you know that we're finding you know some of the clubs are already struggling because that's 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 something that people have had to let go just to survive. So yeah, we we won't really know what's going on for, I mean, Western Australia, we're back pretty much to normal, the new normal now. So full contact sport is allowed to, to restart. So football starting, soccer, all of those things are starting, but we won't know for a few weeks really who's coming back, who can afford to come back and, um, and that sort of things. And the clubs will be, you know, really working out what, what, their, what their duty of care is, is around with their, with their players. And club yeah. Thanks, Paul. Um, thanks for thanks for being here today. Thanks for all you gave us at lunchtime too. For those who don't know, Paul is with Bouncing Back, which is a cricket-based uh, mental health program, men's mental health program in WA. Uh, so Josh's question was simply, um, how can sporting clubs better engage men with with health professionals? So uh, anyone on the panel want to jump in on any of those? We've got you know that sort of that culture of alcohol around sport. We've got um, concerns about the new normal and we've also just got a general question around how can you know how can clubs engage men better with health professionals anyone want to jump in from the panel on any of those points before we do a final round yeah i'm happy to answer from the health professionals aspect um thanks for the question josh it's it's really important we've found through our programs as i mentioned before about having provisional psychologists at every session it enables the participants and and men to be able to build a rapport with someone so that they feel more comfortable perhaps going to see them and that they're, they're given that support to be able to navigate the pathway into seeing the psychologist for ongoing support. So they're, they're almost taking a step, they're skipping a step. They're not getting a referral and they're not then wondering who they're gonna to talk to and they're not wondering if they're gonna get along to them. They actually put them in an environment where they can start to build that connection and then they're more inclined to perhaps go and see the health professional. We also have health professionals come and actually deliver the education. So we get a localized health professional to come and talk to them about healthy eating. So it might be the dietitian from the local health service and they've got a chance to meet them and they've got a chance to ask questions and find out how best to navigate the pathway into that local health service where they may not be given that opportunity in the community otherwise or know how to do so. Great, thanks. Um, thanks, Kat. Emma, you've got a point? Yeah, I just we do something similar. So we engage with a lot of, of health services and it's, it's quite similar. So we have some partners who 
struggle to engage men. And so when they've got a, a room full of 30 men who are there and, and willing to listen, um, they jump at the chance to be involved in what we're doing. But one of the things that we have found has been quite important, we collect data. So we run our program as a, a randomized controlled trial. We've run a pilot and a fully powered trial um, to make sure that what we're doing is, is actually effective before rolling it out on a large scale. Um, but what we found is a lot of men if they're not engaging with GPs, they might not have had a blood pressure check or something as simple as that for a long time. So we actually give them uh, a printout of the data that we collect from them at baseline, which includes their, their BMI, their waist circumference, their blood pressure, um, their physical activity levels. And we actually ask them to start a conversation with their GP and actually take that along. Um, and we've actually found something quite similar. We've had a couple of guys that have been diagnosed with diabetes, um, with extreme hypertension. We've had a few guys who have realized that they were struggling with their mental health who probably didn't really know um, what those symptoms meant before. So I think presenting information and actually explaining what those health results actually mean in a way that's really easy to understand and then linking men to their health services in their, their area um, or their community is, is a really important um, addition to these programs as well. Right, thanks. So once you've built a relationship, a little nudge can go a, a long way by the sounds of it. Um, I'm gonna um, just leave those questions there, but if you had something you wanted to say, panelists, maybe try and link it into your, 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 final, your final comment, because I'd like to get you finished by 3.15 as promised or as, as close as we can. So on alcohol, um, I've just popped a link in the chat box. We've got a fantastic workshop on men's risky drinking uh, tomorrow with Associate Professor Steve Robert, Roberts, who's done, uh, is probably leading the field in Australia in terms of looking at uh, uh, healthy, uh, risky drinking cultures, particularly amongst men. So check that out. It's a 90 minutes workshop. It should be excellent. Um, and I've also popped a survey link in the chat box. So if you've got a moment, do, do take a few minutes to fill out the survey once you've heard what the guys have got to say on their final minute. So look, you've got 30 seconds, guys. It's your kind of, your final takeaway um, message. What thought, what call to action, what words of, uh, words of inspiration do you want to, do you want to leave us um, with? I'm going to come back to one of the guys because we just heard from Emma and uh, Kat. So I'll start. With Dave, with you, please. <clears throat> Thanks, Len. Look, I, my, my call to action would, would just be based around um, that simple fact, and I love what Jake's doing. I think a lot of us, I'm oh, sorry, I can't speak for anyone else, but I know I have, um, having worked at administrative level with sporting clubs um, and been heavily involved with sponsorship and, and all sorts of different levels, um, it's great to finally hear practical um, resources being deployed out there into the marketplace for want of a better term. So my call to action would be, um, you know, obviously if you see my head pop up again <laughs> somewhere, get me into your club and get me talking because um, there's certainly some participants out there, I'm sure, um, that need to hear my message. Lived experience is so powerful. Um, but yeah, think about your club and really put your hand on your heart and, um, and, and ask yourself an honest question. Um, are you connecting? Are you really, really connected to the fact that, that mental health is really important at your club and what are you going to do to address uh, any situations that may arise? Cheers. And thanks for being here, David. The very, very best of luck with that project. It is, it's a lot of hard yards when you're first starting off, but uh, keep at it, my friend, because it's clearly needed and I can see it going from strength to strength in the years to come. With Thank your, you. Under your leadership. Um, so I'll come back to, to Kat, please, and then I'll come to Jake. Yeah, so just again, some of the messages that I talked about before, just making sure that you're capitalizing on that ability to engage people, it's so powerful. Remember it is a neutral brand for, from that health lens. A lot of healthcare um, organizations do have a stigma attached, but football and sporting codes seem not to have that same stigma. And just remember to use your voice and advocate on pretty key issues, but take action from that advocation as well. Great, thanks Emma. So, sorry, thanks, Kat. I apologise. Jake and then Emma. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for <clears throat> taking the time. It's, uh, it's been great listening and learning, and it's always um, a fast-developing world as we find ourselves in at the moment, no doubt. So challenging is for everyone involved. Uh, a couple of things. When it comes to engagement, a few things that we've learned over the journey, um, if you really want to – if we're targeting, let's say, predominantly men from 25 to 35 years of age, 
Uh, most people, most men, they're around that age bracket in our sporting clubs are generally tradesmen, tradespeople uh, that work full long days, get to training, sport. Um, and generally, most often, the last thing they want to do is sit in an education program. Um, it's just how, how they're wired. Uh, so the best thing to go about in, in engaging that, you know, sending people from the outside into the sporting clubs, ha- have a think about what that young man wants to see in front of them. It's not a counsellor with a white shirt and suit shoes. I can guarantee that. Uh, have a think about what they're wearing, the way they language, what their experience is in sport. Uh, we take that right through our program. That screening part of it is really, really important because that connectivity, rapport and trust, you don't get very, uh, you get one chance really in a sporting club to, to build that. Um, so always keep that in mind when it comes to engagement. You can find those people in the community. They do exist or they, they're supported by someone in the community who hands them over to that person uh, in the room, in that environment uh, very safely. And the last thing would be, uh, anyone who's involved in all, all the programs we've mentioned now, anyone watching who's involved in sport across the country or schools, if anyone wants to reach out to us, uh, you can jump on our website, social media. Like I'm more than happy to be an open book for anyone with what we find and what, we, what we've been able to uh, establish and use our experience to hopefully um, build better programs for you all moving forward. So I understand there's a couple of you guys in Western Australia. I'd be interested in talking about uh, what we do over there. We're f- federally funded for four years in WA. 400 sporting clubs and 200 schools um, and so we have some potential to work in together with some um, stuff that we're doing uh, as well so and same thing in Queensland New South Wales and Victoria now Kat I want to talk to you uh, we're doing a trial with PHN Ballarat suicide prevention trial for 31 clubs over the next 12 months um, so yeah Great. Good chat. thanks Jake you. So I will knock on to Emma before chess passing to Timmy to slam dunk and bring us home. How about that? Oh, nice. Well done. Um, I think one of the key take homes to me is that um, men are hard to reach when programs aren't designed for them. So we need to look for opportunities to really develop environments that are supportive, environments where men feel like they are part of a team um, and part of a family and part of that community. They want to look better, they want to look after themselves, they want to take better care of themselves, be role models for their kids. Um, they want to discuss mental health when we give them the chance to discuss it and we create that space where they feel like they can, they, they do open up. Um, and I, I really think that we can just all work together, just mirroring what was said earlier. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. There's so many amazing programs. So let's work together. Let's recognize the strengths of men and create opportunities for meaningful engagement. Wonderful. Thanks, Emma. Uh, Timmy, over to you, my friend. Oh. Hearing the um, great stories about everyone's um, uh, journeys and programs, um, you really think about this whole session that's happened here, everything that has happened off the field or off the court. Um, and, and that's pretty exciting, um, even though we're talking about, about sport. Um, in terms of engaging, I, I think using the language working with and not for um, in, in our stuff. And in terms of the whole process, it can look a bit daunting um, in terms of sometimes getting some, some outcomes with the statistics and figures. So celebrate the small wins along the, the journey. And it's all about the process um, rather than the end result sometime as we come to the end of the session. Mm. Right. Thank you so much, Timmy. Great way to conclude the session. Um, this has been awesome. I've just really enjoyed this conversation. What fantastic work you're doing. What fantastic um, insights. It just gives us a sense of just so much to celebrate, but also just so much potential for how much more we could be doing, not just yourselves, but all the projects involved here today and the many projects that uh, we haven't been able to include on, on, on this occasion. We've gone a few minutes over time, so I'll say... Just a big thank you to each of the panelists. Uh, one more time, uh, Dave Oliver, Dr. Emma Bird, Kat of Sons of the West, <laughs> Jake Edwards and, uh, and, and Timmy Duggan. You're all a bunch of legends in my book. Thanks for everything you do and thanks for giving your time um, so generously and, and sharing both your lived experience and your professional experience of the great work that you're, you're doing. Um, 
We're going to shift the pace now to a bit of a more conversational style to bring the day to an end. Uh, panelists, you're very welcome to stick around if you've got a bit more time. And you're also very free to go if you have to go. You've already given uh, enough of your time very generously to us today. So, so it's official thank you and goodbye. But do stick around a little bit if you, if you want to.